All right. Uh, really glad to be joined this this episode with Ron Shaw, CEO and co-founder of Obvi Collagen. Um, it's really nice to have you here, Ron. Uh, thanks for having me, Chase. And uh, honor to be here because I'm excited to finally be able to connect you with you um, in a in a little bit more real real time uh, outside of Twitter too. So excited yeah. to be here. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Oh, I wanted to. Obviously, there there are some accolades that we could talk about. You guys have been um, you guys have been scaling and doing a great job. I think I would love to hear about your history because I know you moved from finance to consulting and then moved into marketing. I loved one one part of your bio that you worked at Hooked on Phonics. I think that's like yeah. I want to hear a little bit about that. That's amazing. But how does how does one go from from finance and consulting uh, to becoming uh, CEO of a company like Obvi? I'd love to hear kind of. The, the genesis of that story yeah no, that's a great question um you know for me i was actually brought up with uh following my dad's footsteps so my dad's been an accountant he's been working at a company called ernst and young for 30 plus years um climbed the ladder and that's what i was going to chase um and so i was an accounting major always knew i'll be an accountant um, so went to school for accounting, graduated with an accounting degree, got to work at a big four called Deloitte, uh, where I did accounting and consulting. Um, and I was on that path. And um, it was funny because it was it was the apartment building that I moved to um, in New Jersey. And uh, they were brewing a company called Shreds there um, in, in, the, in, in the top floor of that uh, apartment building. And I happened to run into one of the founders in the elevator. And he said, hey, uh, we're looking for someone with, you know, some finance background. You looking for a new role? And uh, I remember I had went to my dad and I said, dad, they were looking for a controller. I could be a 22 year old controller. And my dad's like, uh, I got to meet the founder. So my dad came and met them, vetted them out and said, if I'm going to let my son take this opportunity, you guys better make sure you take care of him. Um, so took that leap of faith of leaving my accounting background behind in, in the sense of a, a career wise and took the leap of faith to become a controller at a um, startup called shreds and from there that just spun into a whole world of learning marketing and how to build a brand and how to incubate other brands and learning what mistakes to avoid learning what mistakes can kill you um, and so it was just such a great patch of learning one of the coolest things i got to do there uh, we had to work, you were required to live in the building, but you had to work um, two shifts. So you work from nine to six, you go home, shower, eat dinner, you come back at 8 p.m. to do your second shift and you work till about two to 3 a.m. Six days a week, your only day off was Saturday. Um, that work ethic that got embedded with me early on has stuck with me. So it's like you kind of take some of the good, the ugly and the bad and, and you kind of mix it on and, and take an experience out of it. So that that's where it started. And then, you know, happy to walk down the journey. But uh, that was definitely cool. This really is it, really fascinating because, you know, I talked to a lot of, of young people and you can feel the ones that just are hungry and are going to go get it. But I, I always advise younger people to, you know, there's obviously the branding you want on your resume, but also you can't make. You almost can't make uh make up for the time that you go and spend at a startup and you're working those oh, 16 yeah. hour days and it's it's literally the the elon musk thing where he's like if you work at a startup and you work 16 hours a day and you're dedicated those 16 hours a day because the work is so intense you essentially get three to four years out of every one year and you accelerate yeah. yourself you know kind of right not exponentially but like in two years you're at a person who's eight years working at a regular nine to five and so yeah. You see these people, and, and I'm sure that kind of intensity of work just kind of helped you propel you into the kind of next few things that you did. Yeah, no, yeah. 100%. And uh, it, that what you said about you know when you're young, taking that little bit of a risk, um, it is it's very scary because uh, so many startups are going to failing. Um, but if you look past, because the startup I worked at in technicality failed too. We grew it to 100 million and it went down to 10 million. Um, and so in a way, it was a failure, but the extraction of the experience and the embedded work ethic and the propensity to take on risk, that never leaves you. So like it pays off failure or success. Um, and I think that that part is is, is often not recognized. Yeah, I mean, most people 
who have successes in their startups are not, you know, these Mark Zuckerberg stories. They're a person who has had one, two, even sometimes three times where they haven't hit a home run. Maybe they hit a single or they hit a single and then they, you know, they lost. And it's more about kind of the compilation of those of those stories and those lessons that you take that allow you to go to the next level because you you play smarter the next time. All right. Yeah, right. so that's that's su super interesting. I almost think we could do an entire podcast about what happens when you do a a, a company to hundred million and then it drops down to ten. And yeah, kind of yeah. That story is. I almost want to save that because that sounds. Yeah, we got to do episode two for that. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, that'll be the next episode. Well, yeah. Intro will be Dre. I um, love that. <laughs> yeah. So. After that, obviously, you worked at a couple different companies, and then you started. It, it was uh, Ghost Media, is that right? Yeah, it was Ghost yeah. Three Media. Um, so what I uh, got the opportunity to do is at Shreds. I also met my two other co-founders, hmm. who uh, also double as my best friend, who also were my best men at my wedding. Love so it. Um, it was really cool because it was an experience that I never expected um, to to extract on that on that end too. But um, we basically all left Shreds together. I, at that time, um, we kind of all said, hey, we'll do something together, but we still need financial freedom right now. Mm -hmm. So we went and all worked at different companies. Um, I went and worked at um, uh, Hookdown Phonics, uh, where I was a marketing director, bringing their digital, I mean, bringing their analog product digital. Um, and then Ashwin, my other partner, he went and worked at an Amazon marketing company. And then Ankit worked at a vegan supplement brand, um, which I also got to, to have a small stint at. But point being, our goal was, OK, we're going to have to separate right now because we're leaving. But let's brew something together. So Ghost 3 Media was Ghost. The idea of it was we're not going to tell anyone we're doing this because what if we get in trouble by these companies? And then three was um, it's just the three of us. And it's always been the three of us. And we were a media company. So as um, uncreative as possible, that's the name of the company. We started that and our goal was, what if we can just start off by helping one other supplement brand avoid the mistakes that we saw the, st the startup that we worked at make? And that brewed into three years of helping 25 plus health and wellness brands in a boutique fashion of going in and almost being mechanics like, hey, if you're doing this for your performance marketing, let's tweak this. If you're doing this for your package design, let's make it a little bit better. If you're doing this for your ops and finance, let me tweak it a little bit. Um, and it turned into like, we'd almost be like kind of business consultants for different verticals. And what's really cool about this was we each also redefined what we're great at and what we're craftsmen of. And so we basically start to take that now and say, all right, now we're gonna use this information and one day create our own brand. So what we call it is Shreds was like our high school years. Our media company was like our college years where you kind of take your major and you say, I'm going deep into it. And then what Obvi was is our final thesis from everything we've learned in our life. Um, and so that's been the journey. Well, oh, man, I absolutely love that. It's, it's such a, um... it's funny because again, like I was telling you, um, you know, my, my dad, um, he always talks about how he learned he learned everything on the streets and yeah. that everything kind of you know you you build thing you build things up um and and it it leads to you know new new experiences and you know i could tell you i could write a book um about all the all the stories i have from him but what i did was i learned certain things from that in my entrepreneurial journeys and good things happen bad things happen because maybe you take risks you shouldn't when you're 24 and you know right. Et right um but i think what what you just brought up is is so fascinating is if you find the right people, you hold on to them because you know that something yeah. good will happen. It doesn't mean you, it's not, it's not now all the time, but it means that one day, yes. uh, I'm not saying it's never, we're not closing the book. So I'm, so you were on the business ops side of shreds and then you obviously made a very concerted effort to help a very certain kind of company and start yeah. a certain kind of company. I'm, I, ha I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. Is there is there a real a specific reason like that sparked the idea to start a company and stay in this space? Like, a, is, yeah. it a business, is it a business metric idea, or like where does that start? I think it was purely how how almost instant you can see your results um, 
both on a simple KPI standard of um, direct response um, being a, a big methodology of how to acquire customers, but secondly, on the customer end, being able to see them get results and bring that feedback loop right away, um, it's, 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 it's phenomenal to see it. I mean, you think about some people who sell, let's say food or beverage, um, that don't have, let's say, performance and more so just taste um, elements to it. The feedback loop's a little bit drawn out because it's like, all right, well, how often is someone going to talk about like how good something tasted? You know, maybe they'll leave a review or something. Whereas all of our products that we worked on and in this industry is results driven. And results in a lot of our different products are pretty much in the first two to four weeks. So to be able to do a direct response ad send out a product in a week, get feedback in two to four, you can literally carve out your business to be the way you want it to be. So that's what interested us. And when you were choosing specifically like collagen um, and like how you're pricing and everything, obviously there is some math that goes in there where you say, okay, you know, if we're able to model out, you know, this kind of CPA or CAC, and we know yep. that kind of these products have this kind of, you know, long-term LTV with a customer, we can be profitable here on this purchase. And then we're going to be able to, to kind of move forward um, from dollar zero and, and start scaling our profit. Cause I know you started, you guys started the company um, with, you know, a small seed of like 10, 10 K and you bootstrapped from there. So yeah. Um, is that kind of one of the other reasons why we said like this just feels like the right product because you guys had incubated so many other brands at those exactly. Companies? That was that was the other big piece of it is um the low barrier to entry um we could have done tons of other products but if you really boil it down to it's the crux is low minimum order quantity um being able to come out with a business and the, there's pros and cons to it right the, the con is is anyone can do it yeah the pro is is everyone has the ability to do it yeah and so like it's cool because we were like, oh, shoot, we could do this. Everyone put in $3,000 into a bank account. Our first PO is done for, right? Our marketing, we don't have to hire an agency because Ash can handle it. Our design and packaging, Unka can handle it. Finance, ops, I got it. So we literally thought we can just do this brand and we don't even need to think about anyone else besides us three. Until this day, I mean, we're, our team is only nine people today. You know, three years later, thirty million dollars in sales later, it, it, it's that that mentality hasn't changed technical, technically. So um, I think part of it was being able to have no barrier to entry, um, not having to spend tons of money to launch something, and then also having the craftsmen on our team that knew the space and be able to disrupt it right out of the gate with you know package design, ad formation, copy, and creative. So there's two dovetails off of this that I think are really important to talk about. One is when you choose co-founders, right? So a lot of times when you hang out at companies or you're with people, you hang out with people who are kind of similar to you. You're in the same org, et cetera, and you become homies, yep. not necessarily cross-functionally. So sometimes you're in small places, so you, you work cross-functionally with people. But if you're in a bigger organization, you're just hanging out with your marketing friends or you're hanging out with your engineer friends. and I feel like you guys had the, almost like this perfect triumvirate where it's like, look, I got this, you got this, you got this. And it's like three legs of a, of a stool. So you guys yeah. all balance each other out. How do you, when you talk to, you know, young, younger people who are thinking about starting a company or people who are asking your advice, how do you advise yeah. them generally to choose their kind of co-founder cohort, if you will? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And actually something I wish I was asked more often because it's so important and is, is, you know, it's so often forgotten that if you're doing it alone or just with another person, you're missing something that you're gonna need to hire out the gate. And uh, people don't realize we didn't need to. So bootstrapped is sometimes not synonymous to the team you have. We were able to bootstrap because we were able to save 20K in costs in personnel. So to go back to tying your question, um, one of the biggest pieces for us was we were almost like at, at the, the first company we started at, we were the, the, 
the true operators of the business, whereas the C-suite were the true window shopping operators, right? Which is great. I mean, they, they set a precedent. They taught us a lot. But at some point, it became down to, Ash, how are the ads? Ron, what's, what's finance and ops looking like? Ankit, how is the next packaging design and website coming along? So when it came down to it, even in meetings that we would have with the board, it would be us three. And so when you're kind of having the dynamic where you're running the business almost in a way, um, it was really cool. And then I think the second part that was really cool is till this day, you know, eight years later, um, we are completely agnostic to the other person's work. Like we, there's nothing like, oh, Unky, could you change the packaging? I don't like it. Or there's, there's nothing about Ash, could you run the ads differently? It's not what I wanted to see it. Or I'll never have a question around finance or ops. And it's not because we don't know enough about the other domain. It's we truly trust the other person to be the best in that domain. So with that being said, my advice to a lot of people is, is it's okay if you have similar skill sets, but defining a domain for each person and saying, you are going to be responsible for this and I'm not gonna be in your way, but I'm going to hold you accountable for handling it is so much more important than like, oh, I'm, I'm giddy giddy with my friend and we do the same stuff and we know the same things because um, conflict is inevitable in that model. Um, so in my opinion, I think uh, the better route to go with this is um, to find, if you can, a very vast skill set base across whatever group of founders you have. If you can't, defining the ability and the need to learn different skill sets and then owning them, I think is important. So uh, that could just be the clip. That's the whole pod right there. Like <laughs> literally uh, absolute uh, gold bars. Um, I think one question that comes off of that, and I have one follow-up that's more about the brand specifically, but how do you, so you, you said at the top, they double as your best friends. They were your best men. I'm sure they're going to be the first people besides your family at the hospital after <laughs> your baby is born. Um, your biggest cheerleaders. How do you hold your each other accountable? Because I think they're like, as much as we all want to be friends and business is business, right? So how how is their kind of like you re remove the friction from that so that you're able to because you guys have worked together for a long time. So there has to be some mechanism you guys have to be able to deliver yeah. feedback while also still maintaining the friendship. Yeah, the mechanism is is um and it's not applicable everywhere so it's it's it may not sound possible but mechanism is is if we're going to fail we're going to fail together and we have failed uh this was in our first business but um if we're going to fail even after building this 30 million dollar business if it goes down to zero figure out the next thing um and part of it is it's starting to detach that oh well what if you want to live a different lifestyle and you want to live a different lifestyle this and that and those dynamics do come up here and there but at the end of the day everything we've always done has been equal it uh, there's nothing it, it we have to put titles on our roles because that's what the public demands um uh, but there's no such thing as titles we're co-founders and we get the job done um and so when it's so kind of like yo i just need this done and can you handle it can you do it it's there's there's this layer of trust that's so strong that um you don't need to question it because there's been very few times something has been dropped or not brought to completion and so when you have that um consider it done attitude it's hard to bring break that dynamic and then lastly i think again no matter what we build out v2 or any of our other companies we are okay with if it if it goes down to zero because the what we're learning in this and the ability to share what we're learning i mean it's phenomenal you know um the, the money making money is just the ability to buy more um and so at the end at the end of the day it's it's like 
when you can take that element away and still be able to take away learning, that's the price that we're truly um, excited about. So it's really funny. I've had a lot of these conversations and I, I always have said this to people, the less I cared about money, the more money found me. And yes. it literally, the more I cared about money, more, more money ran away from me. Um, and so it's really interesting to hear kind of every single person I talk to, all the founders, all the high end operators are, they just love the game. They literally do it for the love of the game. The outgrowth, obviously, is, fi is financial. Uh, if you do yep. something well, you will be compensated well for right. it. Um, right. And all money does is just unlock doors, right? It just greases it. tracks and allows you to go farther down the tracks or, or whatever, maybe in a nicer car uh, or right. a nicer part of the train. Exactly. Um, exactly. But I, I, I keep wanting this brand question, but things keep dovetailing off of what <laughs> um, And this is, this is uh, we talked about both, you know, uh, I'm I'm Persian. I know you're you're uh, Indian, and so I'm curious because your your co-founders are also Indian. Is there yeah. a level of cultural understanding that also allows oh, 100%. The, the like the 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 dynamic to work? Because I I have seen different cultures work together, and it's fine. Um, but there is something a little different where there's a shared experience across your entire life. So I, I've been trying to, I'm joking around with the Persians I find on, on D2C Twitter. I say, we got to make Persian D2C Twitter a thing. Yeah. And I think yeah. we're going to just make Middle East uh, Persian yeah. D2C Twitter a thing because then we can bring everybody together. Everybody together, yes. More of a thing because we all want to dance and have long parties. Yes, have yes. A time. The culture is one and the same. <laughs> yeah, but so yeah. I'm, I'm curious how much that has like helped you guys also kind of weather some of these things because there's so much shared experience that you guys have. Huge. It's huge, right? Uh, because when you tie back um the personal overlap um when there is less and less of a disconnect there it's naturally going to pay in your favor right um so for us it's huge because our wives can also talk to each other right um we've somehow found a, ourselves in the same friend circle now you know um they understand like when i was going through my wedding the wedding is going to cost me six figures and it's going to last five days and I need to save up for that. Um, you know, it, it, there's so many different dynamics of different things that come up um, that you can't teach sometimes because it can come off as what are you trying to say here? Um, I don't have to teach anything and no, nor do they have to teach me anything because we get it. So that's a huge part of it. Yeah. So it's so cool. It's, I, I love I love that. Um, so the question I've been keep pushing down the line is, I, I really believe in this idea of moats. And so it's something that people talk a lot about in, uh, in like we talk a lot about in like B2B SaaS, what is the moat or the unique thing that gives you protection in your business? And so you said something earlier, was it like, look, the barrier to entry is we had 10K, we were able to place our first PO. So there is no barrier. It's more anyone can do it, but also the barrier is kind of like anyone can do it. So no one will actually do it. Right, right. Uh, what I have found, and again, forgive me for putting words in your mouth, is Obvi has incredible branding that is very different. It almost zigs where everyone zags, and that's the blue ocean you guys went for, because yeah. there's a very specific way that all the rest of the brands in this space, you know, Vital Proteins, uh, Ancient Nutrition, U Theory, all of them do it in a very specific way, and it kind of all is like they've homogenized that branding style. Yep. Obvi is the antithesis of that and so yeah. that almost feels like the moat that you guys yeah. started with yeah um and then built into the you know all the community stuff so I'm, I'm curious like what was the thinking there was there like was it a concerted thing based on what you'd learned at ghost three or where, where did that all start yeah it, you know what it was it was um part of it stems from we got ten thousand dollars to not mess this up and now if you take that and you boil it down um, so you put $10,000 on the, on the wall and you say, okay, what, what does this mean? Right. Or you're like, okay, it gives you an order, right? The ability to order something. Cool. What are we going to order? Well, we're going to order something that's going to give us the opportunity to be, be different and disruptive. Otherwise, why would anyone want to buy it? So now you take that and now you dovetail right off of that. And you say, all right, so if we have to be different and disruptive, what are two things we have in control to be different and disruptive? So one is 
branding, color, design, packaging. And two is formula, science, what's in the product, et cetera, right? So we said from there, we'd say, okay, cool. So basically what's in the front of the label and what's behind the label, right? Cool. So now let's boil that down more. What can we do on the branding, packaging, design side to be so damn different that it becomes so obvious that you want this product when you first look at it? So we said, okay, what if we went female, pink, flavors, everything everyone's not doing? So we have one reason for you to come to us on that. Then we said, all right, but what if they turn the label and they say, well, your formula is not that great. Um, your packaging looks great, but your formula is not. So we said, okay, so then the second thing we're gonna make it is we're gonna make the strongest collagen formula on the market. So we're the only collagen, we don't even get to talk about it, but we're the only collagen on the market that has vitamin C, vitamin E, iron, calcium, magnesium, and biotin added to the formula, which is hand selected because it increases the absorption rate of the amount of collagen you're taking. Most of the collagens on the market are just dosed with collagen and you'll see 20 grams, 30 grams, whatever. Your body excretes 90% of that because it can't absorb it. Um, so we said, okay, now if the branding packaging and design is different and the formula scientifically is different, we now have something to present to the judges, which is called the world of disruption, right? So that judges panel is gonna look at everything and say, are you disrupting or not? So when we looked at and then built this product off of the making it so obvious that you have to get our product, why would you look at anything else? Um, helped with the brand name, but also helped with the boat. Uh, I don't know if that answered uh, it, but- 100%, uh, is that where the genesis of the name was? Like it's so yeah. obvious? So it was, it, it kept on being something that we said, like, dude, like we're building, we were getting excited. Like we're building this, like, this is, this is sick. We still hadn't had a name at this point. We're like, dude, it's like, it's gonna be so obvious. Like why would anyone buy vital proteins or anything else? And then I think um, Ankit, my uh, other partner, um, he was watching Mean Girls one day, and uh, one of the girls said the word "obvi." It was uh, one of the girl. It was one of the the lines, and he's like, "Guys, I got it. We're gonna go with obvi." And um, it was like four in the morning. He had already put the logo, made the logo, designed it, and we woke up to a finished label. And we said, "All right, that's it. Um, we're going with it." And we had sent it to the printer next week. That's uh, that's one of those like moments you never forget your whole life. Never, never. Yeah. Yeah, that's Never. literally electric. That's that's incredible. I love hearing those Genesis stories. So, just because uh, I you know I want to nerd out a little bit with you on the finance portion of this. So you're you're adding in all of these ingredients. There are kind of obviously you're buying bulk you're buying bulk orders to be able to create these formulas once you've made your formulation. Did it have a meaningful impact on your margins? Did you have yeah. to it higher, or did you yeah. say oh, we're going to oh. just take the hit because we know that it's going to help us in the long run? No, we priced higher. We went out the gate as a premium product. Mm -hmm. um, our collagen per serving is about eight to ten percent higher than the average. Mm -hmm. um, our thing was though, if we give them so many reasons to why we're better, and only charging ten percent more, um, we shouldn't get crucified for it. Yeah. And um, one of the things we learned is stick by what decision you make when you launch a company. Um, obviously, optimize and and curate other variations, but your initial thesis and why you're going with what you're going with, um, if you change from it, you'll often lead to a path of regret. And if you, but if you stick with it, you'll be much more proud of what you've created as you journey and trek down. Um, and it's easier said than done because some people just don't have it right from the get-go. And we struggled. There are times we still struggle. Uh, retail is tough for us to get into because they're like, why are you priced so high? Well, we're priced so high because our product is the best. Um, if you don't believe in it, that's fine. You know, so I think you have to have that in you a little bit because most of the people are initially going to be brushing you off if you're not commoditized. So there's, there's a thing that I, I, I really believe in here, which is know your business kind of inside and out before you actually start. So it's almost like do a pre-mortem on the business because yeah. everyone does post-mortems and then in the middle, we all get scared and we start over-optimizing. 
But if you can pre-mortem something, you'll have the ability to first have the confidence to stick to your guns, like you just said. And secondly, you'll know kind of what to optimize because you have a true North Star. And I think it's really grounding, but I want to maybe dig a little bit deeper on how you actually action that like as a team or just even as yourself where you say like, okay, for instance, the retail, we could price it a little bit under our price just to get in the door. And have there been deals you've walked away from because they are essentially asking you to be antithetical to kind of the core principles that you started the business with? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think for us, the biggest piece has been um, being able to see so much failure early on has led us to the point of there is no timeline or clock on this. Um, and so if it, you know, we look at examples like vital proteins, right? Vital proteins got acquired on the nine year mark, nine years, right? Um, and there's this, th there's this constant buzz right now. That's how much money have you made in how much time, right? And this race that people put on you. And yeah, we love the race because it, it sets business goals, but the race does not define us. Um, if we had hit $3 million versus 30 million, our motto and our go about it would be the same because we're not for, we're not chasing the money. Um, so for us saying no is literally no problem. We said no to target, for example, we've, um, back in 2020, um, we've said no to Sam's club, uh, earlier this year. Um, there's, there's zero issue with it for us. Um, although it could be great revenue, um, revenue can also be uh the first path to to killing you you know so uh, i think we're just a little bit more tactical in saying no um more often than we say yes i think this is such a good lesson for for founders um especially like first time around this isn't your guys first rodeo watching this happen um you guys have built you know worked at treads worked at other companies and then helped build like you said 20 plus other companies going in there as business analysts is saying no is your your biggest ally because it's actually easier to say yes and oh, yeah. then pay the fucking piper afterwards yes. because yes. not all good revenue not all revenue is good revenue no right? not at so all that are that not at all. anchor on you so i i think that's that's a really salient lesson that everyone should really take to heart because it can really fuck you and we all get excited right you get a big deal yeah. in the contract you're like oh my god target always no. always yes. Yeah. And that's, that's the first, that's the first emotion you get excited. Yeah. And, uh, it, it's, uh, we've learned to take in and, and sometimes, you know, on the flip side of this, I'll argue is sometimes we've become a little bit too numb. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we're, I, I'm very cognizant of it. So I, I try and use different, different things to kind of enjoy the moment too, but like give you an example, Last year, we won brand of the year through Stack 3D. Um, we did 26 product launches, $19 million in revenue, you know, phenomenal, phenomenal performance profitably. Um, when we won that, we got a trophy, took a quick video. We made a couple posts on social and it lasted three to maybe four hours of a high. And by next morning, there was not even a chirp about it. And not the point isn't to dwell on these things, right? Because that's also it's a waste of time. But sometimes when you're built, when you're building your mindset to be like, all right, just keep moving along. A no doesn't mean really no forever. That trains your mindset to start becoming numb to even the wins and the yeses. Because now you're like, all right, it's just another step to the flow. So um i again i think there's always two sides to everything so it's never to be an absolute on anything but um i i do agree with the point you made is 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 a no is um is sometimes the most powerful thing yeah i i, I think it's also one of these uh it's a, a little strange for you know in the echo chamber of social media uh, people you know celebrate you know the wins and very rarely will say you know I, I fucked up, right? Yeah. Um, or yeah. I didn't do well, or like, who cares? Uh, it's like, right. high five, great that we did this, but you know, 
um, you know, just do your job and like, let's, let's keep going. This is just a, another summit on the way up to the never ending, you know, Mount Everest, you know, right. to climb up Mount Everest. This is just a base. Yeah. Um, so getting into like more, you know, tactical stuff. I know you guys, um, this is something I've been trying to push people to look at and pay attention to is one of the, the cheat codes Ash talks about a lot is your guys community and how that allows you to you know, seed ideas, build product launches, build things that people actually want, rather than in, uh, you know, a lot of times people build products in silence, because they're just kind of going and doing what they think is right versus what actually matters to their consumers. Yeah. And so based on having that really, really active community, but also spending, you know, spending a, a, a fair amount on, um, on paid media, what is kind of your retained customers versus new customer acquisition you know split look like on a monthly basis yeah so we're we sit on on a metric level probably between it's about 70 percent new 30 percent retained on a month where we're doing a restock or a big launch we're usually 60 40. um but i would say it could take a good average is 65 35. um and uh we feel that's pretty healthy but we're always trying to improve that yeah Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, I guess, um, on your side, when you're, when you're looking at the finances, you know, what would be your ideal place that you would recommend? So if I came to you, I said, Hey man, you know, my, you know, I'm in an 80, 20 split. What should I actually aim for as like a stretch goal? Obviously there are, you know, there are intermediate. 70, yeah. Yeah. 70, 30 for sure. 70. Um, and I, and yeah. 70, 30, what it gets you is, is just even on, on the sense of like, having a good understanding is when you have 70 percent on the acquisition front it's enough pressure to figure that piece out mm -hmm. right because if you go too much on the other side of 60 40 or 50 50 there's not enough pressure to need to scale to hit 70 percent new acquisition every month you're figuring out scaling somehow um but then the days that you can't and we always call it a factor of three on our end is out of every 10 days we need to factor for three tough days. And what that three tough days do for us is that's where our retention comes and says, I got your back, keep going. Um, and so if you take a factor of, you know, that 10 as uh, a seven to three ratio over 10, um, that's truly how we look at it is if Ash is pumping great for seven days, but then it tanks for three, we're okay. We got, the metrics to support our backing. So, and and we've seen that ratio often, right? You see media buyers talk, oh, great week this week. Damn, this week started off horrific. And um, you need that, you need that support. So I think that's the right balance in my opinion. So I always talk about with people um, that like retention is the power plant of your business. And it is literally because of that exact thing that you said is it smooths over rough patches on the acquisition side, because there's just, there will be volatility like we yeah. all i think we all act like we can control algorithms and we can't uh and no. so we try to like everyone has their own version of like i'm gonna test this yeah. and i'm gonna do that and it's like dude some days yeah. you just the algorithm wakes up on the wrong side of the bed like you yeah can't, you can't control it and so you just got to kind of ride the wave and yeah. building building that backlog of of amazing customer support will yeah. help you and I, I think frankly um Actually, it's not even it's not even revolutionary what I'm gonna say. No brands focus on this. No, yeah. this is like a big B2B thing. B2B people are very focused on their communities and building it up and they become rabid. I mean, Airtable has a crazy community. Uh mm -hmm. Atlassian has a crazy community. Notions community is mind boggling. Yeah. These people who don't get paid by Notion teach classes to other people just yeah. for fun because they love Notion so much. Like can yeah. you I mean, it's insane. Your customers are building recipes, doing stuff for you guys. And I still think people haven't cracked this code. And it's interesting because I was talking to someone the other day about, hey, I want to make an agency. What should I do? And I'm like, dude, make a community building agency. Like no yeah. one, like that is literally no one has. Such that. a good point. Such yeah. a good point. Nobody has that. Um, yeah. Nobody is focusing on that. Um, and I think the biggest piece to all the, all the community element to it is too is, um, I, I kept even even when I was in in Miami doing my geek out speech. The one thing I kept stressing on the community portion um, is the authenticity piece. Um, there are a lot of people 
that want to do community. But within that, a lot of group, there's very few people that want to do it the right way, put the time in it, put themselves in front of it, and lastly, get hit in the face with the good, bad, and ugly of a community. Because till this moment, we still see the negativity, we still see the positivity, and we don't treat those differently. We treat each of them as learnings. So I think that part is very hard for someone to fathom unless you're okay with saying you're right to the customer and soaking that in, you know? Yeah, man, it's, uh, it's such an important thing. And I think that's what you said is incredible because community is a very trendy thing. It's like, if I, I have a question, which is like, what is the buzzword you're hearing a lot of? And I hear everyone say community, 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 but it is, are you willing to take, it's like say someone says, oh yeah, being a parent would be fun. It's like, no, dude, it's you, yeah. amazing. It's not fun, okay? Right. Uh, it's like right. there are amazing moments and then like it's hard and it's not yeah. bad, like the most rewarding thing ever, but community is a is a superpower and a cheat code and all of those things, but you have to be willing to essentially go through the swamp to get there um and and earn and earn it um and there are yeah. a lot of tactical things you need to do so yeah i think that's a really good point i'm not to it's not to necessarily be sobering to people it's just to understand that it's really easy to say something is oh this is cool and it will help our business it's another thing to actually do the work to you know enjoy the business outcomes of something yeah 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 no 100 percent. that's that's i think you 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 encompass that perfectly okay so I'm curious for you guys, what idea do you guys think is going to change the game for where the business goes next? Obviously, we've talked a little bit about retail and you guys are in, you know, vitamin shop and some other places. Um, you obviously have your, you know, you have the D2C channel, you have the community. What's kind of the next big thing you guys are really excited about? Um, bringing a little bit more authenticity on our product level. Um, what we saw happen with Entenmann's was phenomenal. Um, people absolutely loving the nostalgic piece. Um, we are loving the conversion rate and people overall are loving the ability to see a small scale brand work with a billion dollar brand, uh, because it bridges the gap a little bit. If we could do that um, across all our products, what if all our cereal flavors were Kellogg's? What if all of our iced tea flavors were Snapple? What, was, what if you know, uh, our coffee flavors were Dunkin' or Starbucks? Um, that world isn't unreachable anymore. That, that, wor that opportunity isn't impossible, as many, would, uh, it, it, as many a few years ago would coin it. Uh, today, the world we're in, overnight, you can be a trending success on TikTok. Uh, you could be getting reached out by Kellogg's because they saw that your your Fruit Loops posts went viral. So, I think we can the amount of authenticity we have in our community. I feel like we owe it to them to bring our authenticity to our product. Um, I love our fruity cereal collagen, but I would love for it to be Fruit Loops. Or fruity pebbles uh fruity pebbles is taken by another company but point being um i want to completely re-authenticate our brand just saying hey you trusted us with something that was completely generic now we're going to give you an even better version of that so that we can create your stickiness forever with us the entomans thing is such a it, like what you're what you're bringing up is there's like two folds. There's my kind of the marketing side of it, which is you say, okay, well, through osmosis, you become like this household name with people because you're essentially going with all these brands that have all this emotion tied in for decades with people. Right. And right. so that's an incredibly powerful marketing message. And it allows actually the, the floor of your sales for just standard products to actually raise because people associate you with, you know, good feelings after that. I'm, I guess I'm, I'm also, um, wondering 
how does that work in terms of rev share? Do you guys have you you have to have obviously one off deals or deals with these companies? Yeah, yeah. Manage, or do you go and license the name for kind of a given amount of time? What does that look? Yeah, like? so it's always uh, it's always time bound. It's usually between uh, three to five years. Mm -hmm. um, you will have to guarantee them a flat rate over those three to five years, um, and then anything above and beyond that is a percentage. Um, so it's like a typical royalty deal that's time bound. Um, but what's tricky is, is as you talk to higher caliber accounts, such as your Mondelez, Kellogg's, um, General Mills, um, they know what they're worth, you know, they're worth billions. Um, and so the ask is also higher. Um, and so for us, sometimes what we'd like to bring to or bring to manifestation um, is purely bound by a financial constraint and um, not being backed by any funding and stuff like that. That is one of the things we'd have to explore uh, if we did go down that route. But more so, I just wanted to tie the back a vision that we'd like to see come about. Oh, I think the vision is I think the vision is incredible, right? It's um, essentially what will make customers happy and healthy at the same time. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. that's an incredible vision, right? I, yeah. I think a lot of brands will say, okay, well, we just want to make them healthy. We want them to do it our way. It's like, no, we want them, we want to do it their way so that they feel good while they're doing it. Because in this country or a lot of countries, frankly, it's hard to get people to be healthy. Very hard. Yeah. It's, it's uh, very, very hard. It's like, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a massive <laughs> problem in this country, other countries. Um, yeah. And so being able to tie it back to things that, sometimes weren't part of their kind of health journey allow yeah. like it almost allows you to we were talking about money right it almost allows you to grease the tracks towards health even in a more um in a more dynamic way than they would you know naturally saying take collagen exactly yeah 100 yeah. percent. so i always like to know where you get your best ideas yeah that's a good question um i think one of the one of the high level answers to this is being inspired by our community um, is, is a big part of it. But I think truly, I get my best ideas by being plugged into a big group of different manufacturers that I'm speaking to on a daily basis. And it sounds uh, pretty nerdy, but um, I'm uh, in my top nine in my iPhone, you get to pin nine people. Three of them are manufacturers. Um, and uh, they don't work for our companies. I don't even work with one of them as, with any product development. But what I'm constantly doing is um, I'm just understanding what's coming, what's what's going on in the market. Um, so the other day, a manufacturer told me, hey, listen, man, we've been able to figure out how to add biotin in jelly beans. Are you interested? Um, and I'm like, yeah, send me the dye line, send me the packaging, send me samples, right? And that's not my idea, you know, uh, but someone pitched me an idea. But I think he pitched it because the last nine months, we've been talking about 90 different ideas. And I think keeping that door open and changing the way we treat manufacturers is, again, something that's not talked about enough. Uh, everything's coined under relationship building. It's not relationship building, it's time. Um, it's, it's giving people the time they need to feel like they could actually help run your business. Um, when we got awarded the 2021 award um, for brand of the year, the first person I FaceTimed was our manufacturer and said, thank you. Thanks for making this happen. And like, there's just so many little things we forget to do because we expect them to do their job but they're just another cog in our wheel that could completely derail us. So if you don't oil it up and, and if you don't take care of it, um, it's going to get rusty. And then the, the idea funnel also gets rusty. Um, ours is so fresh to like the other day, a manufacturer told us, Hey, I got edible glitter. I want you guys to be the first one that come out with it. Right. These are just little things. And you're like, yeah, I'm doing it, you know? And so, Ideas are coming from the ability to spend time 
with different people in different parts of the business, not just, hey, let's market this. Um, you know, what are we going to get to market? That's yeah. that's the cool part. Uh, I love I love that flip. I think we all talk about like, what are we going to market, not what are we going to get to market. And yeah, um, you can't market shit if you don't have epic products. Like, literally, exactly. it's like there's no point. I mean, it's you know we always talk about it pencil. We can make you a lot of ads, but if you put shit in, you just get a lot of shit out. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. It's the, exa it's the exact same thing. I mean, this is this is um, this is the second conversation I've had with um, founders who are really dialed into their manufacturing, like obsessed with it. Yeah, you literally said if you don't have good relationship with your manufacturers, you are f u c k e day the yeah. fucked. Yeah, like yeah, absolutely, 100%. Un absolutely 100%. positively fucked. And yeah, you're just what, a time bomb ticking. Yeah. Um, I've seen, of ideas. It, I've seen it happen absolutely happen where the you know you're in a you're in a crunch and you've been a dick yeah you ask them for something and yeah. they're like i owe you no favors you see yeah. for every penny you made my life miserable and you didn't treat me like a human being yeah I, I don't have your back and we forget I, I always tell people like look we look at all these data points and every data point every sale you guys have is a human who's having an experience and wants certain things and so it's the same thing with the manufacturer same exact right? thing yeah. same exact thing yeah. and i think that's um um uh, again i think you have you have such a good handle and understanding because you're getting to talk to so many people of of probably tying in different conversations and whoever the other person is is so correct in um you are going to get screwed at one point because for us our dynamic with our manufacturers are if at any point we get into a financial constraint i rather not eat or i rather not have food on table and no matter what size of company you are, I will never, ever, ever not pay them on time. Yeah. Um, because they're the real engine behind this. Yeah. We're the marketers behind it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, being able to almost treat them like they're part of the company is is very important for us. Yeah, that's uh no one talks about this. So thank you. This is not going to be two episodes we talk about. It. I think it's so important in this space to be focused yeah. on the operational side of things because you can't market shit if you don't have good profit mar you don't have good profit margins and you can't actually get interesting, unique things to market in a way that's going exactly. to exactly value to the customer. Can't be a you can't be another me too product. You yeah. can't be a me too company. Yeah. Um, those are those are the ones that actually um I feel bad for. Yeah. Cause I see them come about and I'm, and a lot of people say like, aren't you scared of sharing so much information about Avdi? Like what if someone copies you? And I was like, the people who will copy me will never be able to copy our work ethic and they'll never be able to copy our time spent with our manufacturers or the way we facilitate different things internally. So you can copy my packaging, but yeah. it won't go anywhere. Um, so you know that's a big piece of that is because of the way the dynamics we have internally yeah. different operation pieces well we talked about moats for the business being some of the branding and packaging and name etc but another one is kind of infrastructure right if you have the right infrastructure to your business that's another moat right we're, we're looking at all these companies crashing and burning right now and it's because yes. they didn't build the infrastructure right and the minute things got tough you know you got to pay the piper sometime and yes. so that's that's like a an anti moat if you will or you're built instead of on concrete you're built on sand and so it's yes. going to eventually happen something bad is going to happen eventually if that going to happen too so these are the philosophical questions portion of it that i i think is i i really like um and so i'm i would love to know what the best piece of advice you ever received were it doesn't have to necessarily be business advice but just in life like what is the best advice you've ever received from somebody yeah um it was it was definitely my dad i mean it's it's pretty simple and pretty pretty much out there commonly but um if you're going to do something learn to become the best at it um and i think every day even as of this morning we're still perfecting what we're doing we're still learning um just because we record podcasts doesn't mean we don't listen to podcasts. Yeah. Um, you know, just because I do mentor pass and mentor other people, it doesn't mean I haven't signed up for mentor pass and joining other mentor calls. Um, the learning piece cannot stop um, because we always need to work on becoming the best version of ourselves. So that was definitely the best piece of advice. Yeah.
it's the Reed Hastings. You need to be an infinite level, right? Yeah. Yep. Great. Yep. That's great. Your dad sounds like a really wise man. <laughs> he is. What's the skill that you think has served you best in life? The skill that served um, uh, being relentless. Mm -hmm. I think um, there's just nothing that comes as like a fear. Mm -hmm. It's like um, you look at something and you're told something and you're like, okay, I'm going to go figure it out. Let yeah. me get to work. Um, and it can be the worst news or the best news. Um, you're kind of like numb to the feeling of fear. You, everything is like, all right, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Um, and so I think that has served me well to be able to do a lot in a short time with something like Obvi. What what do you attribute that to? Because that's not, I mean, it's easy to say. It's it's another. It's a harder thing to act, especially in the face of, you know, uh, like ninety yeah. day terms and and all of these other things kind of bearing down on you. Where where does that come from? Uh, it's it's. I think it's the same thing that I kind of referenced. I think in the other question, which was, I think it ties together. Is um, there's zero fear of failure, because even if I fail. I'll come out of this learning so much that I could go and do, I can get, if I get to 99% point with this, I've learned 99% of it. Now I need to just make sure that last 1% is perfect. I'll get to 100% at some point. Um, so it's okay if we take a wrong step, take a step back and have to restart. So when you have that able to kind of like, you're able to kind of swallow that, you kind of look at things and you're like, all right, yeah, what's the worst that's going to happen? Yeah, I, I always say there's no, there's nothing final except uh, is death. So as, yeah. long, as long as you have breath yeah. in you, you can always come back and you can always yeah. learn something new and, and and do do it do it again and do it better. So yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah, so the last one that I think you've essentially done this this whole time. But if I if you could sum it up as like your capstone here what what would you tell a young founder if someone came to you and you said i said like hey i'm gonna start a company and i'm 25 or i'm 26 or i'm 27 um what would you wish that they had told you before you know what uh, i actually would rather reference a book if yeah. that's okay yeah yeah um because this book has kind of changed and paved some of the pathways of my mentality especially in the last probably 18 months um there's a book called um winning by tim grover i don't know if you've read it mm -hmm. um and he's you know the coach of kobe Bryant, michael jordan and, and and such um and there was this one um quote um one question in there that said um if you had to answer this question what does winning mean to you right or how do you know you've won right what is that feeling like um, and he gave answers of different people in different places of their life. And um, what was really cool was, and I'd, I'd love to ask, Jay, ask, actually ask you, I don't know, unless you read the book, but um, if you had to define winning in a sentence or a phrase, what would you say? Oh God, first question back to me on this whole process. Sorry. No, it's good. <laughs> good. Um, winning to me is. It's not about accolades. It's about personal satisfaction with the work that's been done. Okay. So do I feel like I have given my all to something so that I don't feel like I left anything on the table? That's that's winning. If I can say I did that in a certain situation, I'll have won because I know if yeah. I do that, good things will, are the outcome. Um, yeah. That's I, I I care more about the work than anything. Have do you think you've won yet? Absolutely not. Yeah. So no, I love the. I mean, you're, you're on the same exact page because what was really cool about that book, it answered um, the it, the way it answered the question was um, some people say winning is um, uh, winning is when I'm happy, winning is when I'm content, or winning is me doing everything that I had set on my goal task list, right? And and saying and and saying, hey, you know, this is what it is. And then he had asked the question to um, Michael Jordan. And Michael Jordan's answer was winning is everything. Mm. Um, there's not a single other thing that matters. 
then he asked the same question to Kobe Bryant. And um, Kobe Bryant said, uh, winning is nasty. It's gross. You hate it. There is, um, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, adjectives he had used, but basically saying it is one of the dirtiest processes in the world. And what that taught me is until my answer feels like one of those, yeah. I haven't done anything. Yeah. So you're just on this journey to constantly try to win, but until it gets to the dirtiest point or when it may, or when it gets to a point where it was everything yeah. that it is today, yeah. then you've won. So that my opinion, my, my, my advice to those founders, the younger founders would be, um, don't think you've won because you hit a milestone. Uh, that's just a step in the journey and yeah. don't create a milestone as your goal to win. Damn. Let's go. I, I'm ready to win. <laughs> uh, uh, I love closing it off with uh, MJ with air with his airness and the Black Mamba. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, well, Ron, everyone is so lucky, man, for for what you're willing to share and how how open you and your and your team are. Um, good things happen to people who give, um, and so I, I'm. I wish you guys nothing but success. We're going to that. do an episode just talking about shreds because I think yeah, or is this Let's do it? Those oh, lines, down. one of those. Uh, <laughs> what do they talk about? The um, like an an audio an audio journey uh, or like a yeah, yeah. I forget what they call it. Uh, but it's like uh, being being by the fire in the old days, telling a story. Um, so yes. yeah, we'll, we'll do that again. I really want to thank you for coming on and uh, and sharing. Hey, it was a pleasure. Thanks for making the experience for me a little different too, because. Uh, it's typically um, one in the same question sometimes, which is not bad. I still want to keep doing that, but this was cool because it, it, it felt different. It, it, it was a, a lot of different pivoting to a little bit deeper context. So I appreciate that. Oh, that's great, man. I, uh, I'd i love that we were able to, to dive deep and people learn about you and get to learn from you. They're very lucky. Yeah, very no, lucky. I appreciate that, Chase. Thank Thanks. you.